then look at what other people have to face. Every successful person has faced difficulties in their life and career. My guests will share with us the challenges they have overcome on the road to success. Every week we'll follow their story right here in Life with me, Patty Boule. Hello. Welcome to Life with Patty Boule. My beautiful guest today, and she is beautiful inside and out, is the award-winning, award-nominated actress, singer, <laughs> campaigner, and writer. She played the lead in the original production of Hair in London, and she was the Rocky, oh wow, she was in Rocky Horror Picture Show, and is founder member of three women rock group, I, I saw this, called Rock Bottom on which the award-winning TV series Rock Follies was based. <sighs> Annabelle, you know, in show business, okay, challenges everywhere. Tell me what problems you had to face. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, nobody goes into showbiz without knowing they're going to have problems. But I was not, I would say, my generation of women in England were not brought up to speak up. They were not brought up to talk back. We were supposed to be nice and get married, basically. And there was a girl up the road when I was 15 and she was 17, Rosemary Flaherty, she won't mind my mentioning this, I'm sure, um, whose mother told her she was on the shelf because she wasn't married or engaged at 17. Oh dear. Now, <laughs> <laughs> I failed to do any of That's that. That's a bit but, young. But, yeah, <laughs> okay. but that, that, there wasn't, there wasn't much out there for women at the time. And I think I discovered a bit of a stubborn streak because there were things I wanted. And because I got brothers and they could go out into the world and do these things, I wanted to do them as well. So um, I think a little grit got into my soul when I realized I'd have to push if I wanted to get to university. And if I wanted to go into theater, I'd have to push very, very hard. Um, but my mother was very supportive. She'd never heard of university, I don't think, and certainly nobody in my family had ever been there. Well, but for girls, for girls. But one, well, my brothers hadn't, didn't go either. We were not, a, we were not um, um, an academic family. Okay. So that was my my way, I think, of catching up with older brother and sister was to work really hard. So that that gave me a little bit of a start, and of course, um, I was on the cusp. Really, I got to university and had the most wonderful time. But I also discovered, shortly before I'd gone there, I discovered pop music, mm -hmm. which my mother would not have in the house. So I had to practice in secret with a hairbrush, you know, like everybody <laughs> does. And when I got to Oxford, they were just starting a student dance band and they asked me to sing. So I paid my way through university singing um, men because there weren't any women, basically. Uh, who who were on, in the charts? So it was Buddy Holly, Elvis Presley, um, the Everly Brothers. I loved it all. I sang it all. Really? Mm. You didn't have the Ronettes and the? Or well, did they come later? They came a little about the same time, a bit later than the Beatles. See, the Beatles mm -hmm. came in my time, and that overwhelmed everybody. So um, I sang along. I did all my harmonies and everything with the Beatles. I don't know whether I played Paul or John or indeed George, <laughs> certainly not Ringo. But um, that gave me a taste for being out there doing what I like doing. So um, there was a particular show that I know you were in a bit after me where um, called Hair, mm -hmm. which was the first rock musical ever. First time people use handheld mics, the first time there was amplified sound, the first time there was a band on stage, and uh, it changed the world in London. And I had to, I had to work quite hard to get into that. As well, I don't think you did have to work hard to get no, into no, that. No, no, no. I, I, I just badly. fell into it. <laughs> I didn't fall into it. I saw it in the states. And I thought, right, I'm going to be in that. And my agent said, oh, you mustn't go up for a show like that. That's a terrible show. Well, I can show. understand why he said that. Well, yes, I can too, but I'd seen it. I knew what it was like. So I would have killed to get in there. <laughs> so <laughs> in the end, I did. So um, What opposites we are. <laughs> yeah, but you told me you were taught to kill if you had to, and Absol I wasn't. Absolutely. But Not I tell me. you what, but I, I, I wasn't expecting 
I had just come from a convent, for goodness sake, and I ended up in here, which to me was the den of iniquity. So. Of course. And, <laughs> and there was... was a girl before you who was in the original company with me, she wasn't there for very long, who was a nicely brought up Catholic girl who happened to be a dancer and a singer. Who's that? I'm not going to mention her name because she withdrew very shortly because she found it so shocking. Oh, I see. Okay. That she couldn't she couldn't manage it, <laughs> so she got replaced by someone who could. <laughs> okay, that was probably me. <laughs> no, I'm no, only kidding. No, no, I'm only but, kidding. Yeah. But uh, you know, you you had to be well. You know, you had to be quite brave to do it, and it was breaking every single rule oh, in the theatre book. Oh, it certainly and did. Every single rule in society's books about how you behave in public. Every single rule yeah. in life mm. too. And that taught me. I I loved it because I believed in it. I would not have done it had I not been passionate about what it but stood for. But then you for. formed a girl group, didn't you? Well. Yes, and that, that was the point, really, because after Hair, I went back to straight theatre and it was a weeny bit dull. <laughs> it would be after Hair. <laughs> you know, yes. if, it's not, if it wasn't groundbreaking and if it wasn't doing something new and there was no music in it, uh, uh, uh. So, <laughs> so in the end, I had this brilliant idea. I thought, I will form my own three-woman rock group. And one of the people, Diane Langton, was... Also in oh, hair, that's a where lovely I met Diane, her. yes. And another one had been with a groundbreaking theatre company, Joan Littlewood's Stratford East company called Gay Brown. And when you mention the Ronettes, you think a typical girl band at that time was black, American. There would be three. Really? They would be sisters or look like sisters. Isn't they that would... funny? Because yeah. I would think of the Andrew sisters. Well, the Andrew sisters were a generation earlier and... and None of us in rock and roll want to be like them. Oh, I see. But they were, <laughs> okay. they were, ex they had to be look-alike. They were they? brilliant. Um, but you think of, you think of um, Diana Ross and the Supremes. Okay. One lead singer, identical wigs, identical clothes. That's the way it was. And I had Diane Langton. Well, she was on my, this side, actually. Diane Langton was pint-sized, working <laughs> class, <laughs> black curly hair with a huge, wonderful oh, voice. amazing, yeah. Um, Gay Brown was six foot tall, scarlet haired, um, very upper crust, had lethal wit and had a croaky jazz voice. And in the middle was this middle class blonde, um, middle, middle sounding voice, um, Oxford graduate. It was completely bonkers. And everyone said, you can't do it. It'll never work. And I just kept saying, well, why not? Why shouldn't it? And the amazing thing is, it did work. Mm -hmm. It took off like a skyrocket. They well, said, it did because a TV company exactly. tried to copy it, didn't it? Well, didn't no, they? It, they didn't try to copy it. I will say this one. We had this plan we were going to write songs, which none of us had done before. We'd then go and demo them up, which none of us had done before. We'd then make um, a couple of singles, put them out. We'd then make an album. We'd then do, have a television series written for us and about us. We'd do another album. We'd become famous in England. We'd go to the States and make it really big, like mm -hmm. all the, like all the um, male groups did. And everything worked, but it worked a little bit too fast. And the television company came to see our very first show um, and decided to commission a series, a, a drama series, not, not a light-hearted comedy series, yes. uh, but a drama series. And they, the ch person they chose as the writer was a good friend of mine. He knew all our jokes. He knew our backgrounds. He came into our rehearsing. He came to recording studios. He knew everything. Um, and they said, OK, we're going to go ahead. And the next thing we knew was they did go ahead. And they had a tall, aristocratic, red-haired one. And they had a small, dark-haired, working-class one coffee. with a huge voice. They had a middle-class, um, middle-sized, blonde, Oxbridge graduate in the middle. And they weren't us. So I saw my baby, well, A, snatched away, uh -huh. and B, being brought up as to be something completely different. What did they call it? They, we were called Rock Bottom. They changed one word. 
They kept our names, our heights, the colour of our hair, everything. And they called it Rock Follies. Uh -huh, okay. Mm -hmm. And because we'd written nothing down, because we were too busy selling it, really, telling the world how wonderful we were and being it, we didn't have any copyright on it. So... What happened? That, that was the tough one, because we lost our recording contract. If we'd gone on performing, we would have looked like copies of them. Oh, you're kidding. No, because okay. it came yeah. out, and it yes. did incredibly well. It did, I remember. It made yeah. stars of the three girls playing us. It got platinum albums. They did another series in uh, called Rock Follies of 77, and we were just out on our ear. But I think that's when... I, I'm not used, I was not used to standing up for myself. I told you about my upbringing, be nice. But this was too much. I think having a friend steal from you. It's a different thing altogether, It's a different isn't thing. Yeah. I might have said, well, this is Thames Television. They're bigger As than we are. As we all are. do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. well, what can you do? I might have let it go, but because it was a friend in there, that betrayal I couldn't stomach. So uh, I sued them for theft of the idea. Whoa. And that was something everybody said, no, you can't do that. What was the journey like in suing them? Well, I tell you, it was eight years to get it into court. We had to get legal aid, which you would never get now. You know, for, I mean, it's very hard to get legal aid at all mm -hmm. now. But then I had one lawyer who believed in it as an idea. And he believed me. And it turns out, did you ever meet, of course you know Paul Nicholas, don't you? Yes, he auditioned me for hair, yes. Did he? He did. Well, Paul and I played opposite each other in hair. His father was a lawyer for all the producers. Oh, that's right. Oscar yes. Buselink. And so he became sort of grandfather to all of us. And we all went to him for advice. So when this happened some years later, I went to Oscar and he said, oh, you've not been treated well. Right, we're going to get on to this. Right, we'll sue them for this and we'll sue them for that. And everybody said, Oscar's a fool. You're a fool. You can't do it. And it was very, very slow to get it there. We were 16 weeks in the high court. And the judge found in our favour... And that has established a new law, which is the law of breach of confidence and Fantastic. intellectual property. And it means that now, in law, an idea is an, is, can be owned. It can be in what's called intellectual property, and nobody is allowed to steal it. Wow. Well, I wish I'd known you then, <laughs> because, uh, boy, I can't tell you how many programs, you know, one sends to television companies. I know. And I've done that, I think, four times. One actually ended up in America in a film. Mm. You know, I know it's just, there was nothing you could do then because you just had it on a piece of paper. Exactly. But now it's easier to prove, of course, with the internet. It would still and the be terribly email. expensive. It would still be very expensive. And people should learn from me that it's a very simple thing to write down the idea. It's one sentence. Three yes. actresses, all West End actresses, all singers decide to form a rock group. That was it. They couldn't have done it had we written that down. I tell you what I want to know is how did you feel while you're going through that? Because I know the, oh, that feeling of no. going against a big company and f you feel like the whole world is against you. It's very, very scary. And everybody said we had no chance. And I felt sick to my stomach most days. And eight years is a long, long time to keep trying to roll a boulder uphill time. pretty much on my own. I saw something in me that couldn't give it up. And my agent told me that it would look like sour grapes if I did it. And it would have a terrible effect. People told me I would never work in television again. <laughs> mm -hmm. They told me I would never work again. I just couldn't let it go. Yeah. And then one at a time, a few people started to come on board. A brilliant young lawyer who wanted to cut his teeth and paid it attention. Somebody Oscar brought on when I was just giving up. I did give up or nearly gave up many times because... Bear in mind, we'd started the group, I was 30, so we were 
a decade too old to be yeah, in pop. To be, yeah. And then that was my 30s trying to push it, drag it into court. Um, so not having a lot of support behind you was very difficult. But, you know, when we formed the group, we didn't have any support. We had no manager. We had no producer. We had no budget. We had nothing. We had hope. Oh, my goodness. And I think... You had hope. We had hope. See, that's, that's a very that's important word. That's the crucial word. thing. Hope. Because, uh, yeah. you know, a lot, of, a lot of young people now give up so easily. Now, what you went through was not easy. Okay? No, it wasn't. The perseverance, the patience, and also listening to that voice in your head that yeah. says, no, I'm right about this. Yeah, you cannot exactly. take what is mine. Mm. You know, I think that is what really, I, I hope somebody listening to this program right now and listening to what you have to say has to take away is the hope, the perseverance. It's the, the patience that you have to show. And something else I think you need. Mm -hmm. um, and you need that very early on. My son is a musician. And he said to me early on, oh, mum, I don't really have the confidence to go out on stage. And I said, listen, one thing you cannot have until you're used to something is confidence. Exactly. You cannot know you how fake it's it going till to you be. Make it. So what you can <laughs> have, yes. what you can have yes. is courage. Yeah. That's what you need. And if you really want to do something, you have to see why should anyone hand it to you? You have to grab it with both hands. Exactly. And go for it. I and like that. Why should that, anyone in, hand it to you? There's no reason. Because there's no there? one there to hang it. We, we no. all wake up in the morning, we're trying to survive. Right, right. We've got you to know? live our own lives. Precisely. Nobody's going to wait and give you something. You, if you want it, you take it. And I, I also mm. believe that there's a place for everyone in this world. There's a reason for you being there. Now, your reason, it seems to me, okay, I know it was tough, but you've created this, I suppose property rights issues in television because we didn't have any kind no. of right no. because I remember saying to a producer well you've taken my idea you haven't even changed the name he said well you know sometimes when you send us something we look at it it wasn't what we needed at the time we put it in the bin but it's here and sometimes they do that unknowingly and very often they do it knowingly of course but it's very hard. It's still very hard, but you can protect yourself. And anyone wanting to do anything new is going to have a hard time pushing through because everybody says, oh, that's never been done before. And you say, well, no, isn't that a plus? Oh, no. No, we, if, if it's the same thing. I've written a book about this. Yes. And because it doesn't fit in any genre, it's called The Real Rock Follies. I and it's oh, about I've got it happens. here. Oh, lovely. Oh, I've got there it you are. here. It's, there it is. And there it's, we it's are. brilliant. There the you go. The big one, <laughs> the middle-sized one, and the little one. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you for bringing this. But I have one last question, just a quick answer. If you were, would you want to be a young person right now in this era? Do you know, I think I was so lucky when I, when I emerged into the end of teenager towards being an adult. It was the early 60s and the world was opening up to young people. There had been no teenagers before that. Nobody regarded young people as being worth anything at all. Speak when you're spoken to, as my mother's generation were taught. Um, so do you think they have it good now? No, I think life is very hard now. I think it's much, much Extremely. harder. Extremely, I think so we too, We yeah. had it lucky. If you just had that little bit of courage and that little bit of oomph to say, why don't I try that? The people opened doors. They loved it. It's closed back down again. Mm -hmm. So Thank I you. say you have to work harder to these kids, but you'll get there and you won't ever regret doing it. Thank you so much, Annabelle. Thank my, you. Thank my you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.